So we are in Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, and chapter 6, verses 14 through 23. Keep in mind, I give bring chapter 6 in because chapter 6, part of that, includes the offerings that are there in detail in the respective chapters. There are five offerings in the book of Leviticus, chapters 1 through 5. We looked at the burnt offering last week. And so this week we're looking at chapter 2. And so every time there is a chapter on an offering, a sacrifice, there's also a supplementary that's given in chapter 6 that kind of gives us from the perspective of the priest. Uh, Chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 is given from the perspective of the worshiper, the offerer. And the title for this sermon is Bring on the Vegan offering. Last week, we looked at a burned offering. The worshiper would bring a burned offering depending on what he could afford. If he was able to afford a, a bull or an ox, he would bring the, the firstborn, perfect, without blemish. If you could only afford a sheep, Or a goat, you would bring a male sheep or a goat, perfect, without blemish. And if all that you could do is bring um, turtle doves or pigeon, then you bring that. That was a burnt offering to the Lord. When you think about burnt offering, it signifies atonement. And we saw three truths in its application. The first truth is the fact that, um, that it costs us something. Don't give to the Lord that costs you nothing. Worship does cost Him. I mean, cost us. God cares how we worship Him. Second, we saw that God is a holy God, and we are a sinful people. And third, we said the Lord requires a substitutionary atonement. Uh, an innocent animal dying in place of sinful beings, human beings. This week, we'll look at the grain offering, chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And in case anyone is actually reading a King James Bible, it uses the word meat. I grew up with the King James and I often wondered what that was called, a meat offering, It is just that meat meant any kind of food, including grain. The King James translators actually translated that as a meat offering. So it means grain offering or cereal offering. That what we look at here, some of the Bible say meal offering as in M-E-A-L. And the King James uses meat as in uh, animal flesh. But it's It's grain offering. So I'm going to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, and and chapter 6, verses 14 to 23, and we'll pick up from there. So God's word reads, When anyone brings a grain offering, as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. And bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all its frankincense, and the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offering. When you bring the grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, yes, there were griddles in Bible times, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it as a grain offering. If your offering is a grain offering cooked in a pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil, and you shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord. And when it is presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. 
And the priest shall take from the grain offering its memorial portion and burn this on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, for you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as a food offering to the Lord. So no leaven, no honey. As an offering of first fruits, you may bring them to the Lord, but they shall not be offered on the altar for a pleasing aroma. You shall season with all, season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Salt is repeated multiple times, three times. Salt, yes. No leaven, no honey. Verse 14. If you offer a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits fresh ears. That means green. They are fresh, not ripened. Roasted with fire, crushed new grain, and you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it as a grain offering. And the priest shall burn it as a memorial portion, some of the crushed grain and some of the oil with all of its frankincense. It's a food offering to the Lord. Now let's go to chapter 6 and read it from the perspective of the priests. Chapter 6, verses 14 to 23. And this is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord in front of the altar, and one shall take from it a handful of the fine flour of the grain offering and its oil and all the frankincense that's on the grain offering and burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the rest of it, Aaron and his son shall eat. It shall be eaten unleavened in a holy place. In the court of the tent of meeting, they shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my food offerings. It is a thing most holy, like the sin offering and the guilt offering. Every male among the children of Aaron may eat of it as decreed forever throughout your generations from the Lord's food offerings. Whatever touches them shall become holy. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This is the offering that Aaron and his son shall offer to the Lord on the day when he is anointed. A tenth of an ephah of fine flour is a grain, regular grain offering, half of it in the morning and half in the evening. It shall be made with oil on a griddle. You shall bring it well mixed and baked pieces like a grain offering and offer it for a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The priest from Aaron's son, who is anointed to succeed him, shall offer it to the Lord as, it decreed, as decreed forever. The whole of it shall be burned. Every grain offering of a priest shall be wholly burned. It shall not be eaten. This is cool. I wish we had a concession stand. And we had popcorn. And you could buy them and you could sit here and eat it while you listen to a sermon on the grain offering. Maybe you could put some butter on it and I could have something here that I could snack on while we were talking. We are talking about the grain offering. Well, this is the vegan offering. A vegan diet uh, began in this country, I think around the 90s, late 90s. And as you know, a vegan diet restricts you from consuming any animal products like milk, cheese, or honey. In fact, it is said that if you were to be on a vegan diet, to be getting all the nutrition, all the protein, and a healthy dose of protein from plant products, you had to eat a lot of beans. I mean, a lot of beans to literally give you the protein that you need to survive. A Harvard study shows that people on vegan diet could die from coronary heart disease just as someone's splurging on steak every day. But apart from the vegan diet, there is also a religion that discourages consumption of anything that even remotely kills worms or any insects. So they will not eat beets or carrots, anything that grows under the ground. For the, because the process of pulling out the beets and the carrots would maybe kill worms or insects. 
This religion is called Jainism. It's an offshoot of Buddhism. Uh, then there are people who will not even swat a fly because they think killing animals is a sin. Well, the sermon is not a class on diet or ecology. It's basically got to do with grain offerings in Leviticus chapter 2. Completely bloodless, no bloodshed. It was completely non-violent. There were no animal sacrifices. And this is the only one of the five sacrifices. There was a non-animal sacrifice. Only condition, it had to be without leaven or honey, but you need to add salt. Now, there were three types of grain offerings. So again, as I explained to you, uh, a simple outline would be the what, the when, and the why. That helps us understand the book of Leviticus. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to get into it and connect what we were doing then to what we're doing now. So I'll explain to you what this is all about and summarize chapter 2, and then I will say why they did it and how it relates to us today. So let's look at the what. There were three types of grain offerings. As you look at chapter 2, there was the fine flour mixed with oil and frankincense. Verses 1, 2, and 3. And then there was another kind of offering, grain offering, which were cakes made of fine flour mixed with oil baked in an oven, verse 4, or it's prepared on a griddle, verse 5, or in a covered pan, verse 7. And then there's another kind of grain offerings that you find towards the end of chapter 2 in verses 14 through 16 called the first fruits where you brought the fresh heads of roasted grain mixed with olive oil and frankincense. Frankincense is an aromatic spice uh, that gives a nice fragrance when you burn it. So the first one, the fine flour mixed with oil and frankincense, is the procedure for cooking uncooked. That means you bring it to the offerer, you bring it to the temple, it was not cooked. It was was an expression of devotion to the Lord. You bring the best of what you add. It had to be fine flour. It says fine flour in verse 1. The word fine is used about five times in chapter 2 and about two times in chapter 6, meaning it was the highest quality. This is the finest of the kernels that was ground exclusively from the inner kernels of the wheat. Fine, fine flour was considered expensive. So it was only kept for spe- special occasions. Like if you had guests coming in, you would prepare bread out of fine flour. Now we know the story in Genesis chapter 18 when the three visitors came to meet Abraham Abraham rushed in and prepared bread made out of fine flour. There's a lot of work involved in in getting uh, bread out of fine flour. You had to go grind the kernels, pick up the nice kernels, grind it, grind it multiple times. You usually had a donkey uh, tied to one of those grinders that went around the hole in which the kernels were put, and you did it multiple times until you got fine flour. The last thing you want to do after having worked so hard is to take it and bring it to the tabernacle or to the temple. And that's the point here that we see that you ought to be dedicating your hard work to the Lord. It's it's one thing to grow wheat. It's another thing to go through the process of harvesting the wheat and, and grinding the wheat into fine flour and then bringing it to the Lord and giving it to the priests. Let's go to verse 2 of chapter 2. They are to bring it to Aaron, the priest. Bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And he shall take from it a handful of fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense and shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a food offering that is a pleasing aroma to the Lord. 
I believe the frankincense would have given a nice fragrance because you are cooking something raw. You wouldn't consume something with frankincense in it. It was just done to, to give that uh, uh, aromatic smell. And the rest of the offering, you read in verse 2, the rest of the offering is taken, verse 3, shall be for Aaron and his sons. Why it is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. Anyone who came in contact with it was holy. It was set apart, consecrated. In the second set of offerings that you begin in verse 4, the worshiper would bring cooked grain. Makes it easy. They would either cook it, bake it in an oven, which would be more like a pizza oven. It's either in the ground or in the wall, or maybe bake it on a griddle, or it was baked on a pan. Again, it had to be baked of the finest and the best of the blessings the Lord had given. Fine kernel made into fine flour. They would bring it. The priest would burn a portion of it as a memorial offering. It was a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And the rest of it was dedicated or consecrated to the priest because it was the most holy offering. I think the second offering was, would have been loved by the priests because in the first one, they had to bring the raw grain offerings and then they, the priests had to go through the process of cooking it. In the second one, they brought in cooked grain, bread made out of it. It's like, it's like think for this, for example. You make tamales at home. And you remember, okay, I need to go give something to my pastor. If it was the first one, you would bring the, mas the masa and the meat and the corn husk, put it in a bag and bring it here and say, Pastor, this is for you. Or you could cook the tamales and you would bring it to me and give it to me. Which one do you think I like? Obviously, the second one. This was a second grain offering. The third set of grain offering was brought to the tent of meeting during the harvest. And that you find in verses 14 through 16. It was supposed to be the first fruits. It was crushed grain roasted in the fire with oil and incense. It had to be the green kernel. And the priest burned the memorial portion with the oil and the frankincense. And a specific set of instructions are given. As you read, it says, no yeast, leaven, no honey. The reason being both honey and leaven cause the food to ferment or decay. They could be included in the offering, but they could not be burned. But one thing you couldn't miss out, you had to add salt. So having seen how these offerings were brought to the Lord, let's get to the next point. And that is, when were these grain offerings offered? These grain offerings were called, in the Hebrew, minka. M-I-N-C-H-A-H. -H, minka. And it always followed the burned offering. That's why you have chapter 2 after chapter 1. You have the grain offering after the burned offering. It was a way to consecrate or dedicate themselves to the Lord for the atonement. So you had atonement in chapter 1. And now in chapter 2, you are consecrating yourselves to the Lord because you've been atoned. It was atonement. And we read about that in Numbers chapter 28. Verses 4 and 5, it reads, The one lamb you shall offer in the morning, and the other lamb you shall offer at twilight. Also a tent of an ephah of fine flour for a grain offering, mixed with a quarter of a hen of beaten oil. You see, so according to Numbers 28, verses 4 and 5, the grain offerings always followed the burnt offerings. Now, there was another reason that the grain offering was given. The grain offering was also offered as a tribute. A tribute is something that a, a lower servant, a servant, gave to the master. So if you had a king, 
the subjects would bring a tribute to the king. In the case of the nation of Israel, Israel was bound by a covenant with a holy God. God was a sovereign king. And so when the nation of Israel came together, they would bring a tribute to their king. And it was a soothing aroma to the Lord. And we see that in verses verse 2, verse 9, and verse 16. It was a soothing aroma to the Lord. So it was the second thing, tribute. The third reason why they would come and bring was, was part of their harvest festival. When the first fruits were brought, when the harvest came out, they would pluck the fresh green ears of the crop. They would roast it. They would rub it together, get the grain out. And as they celebrated their harvest, the people would thank God for the abundance that God has provided them. We read that in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 9 and 10. It reads, And he brought us into this place, and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God, and worship before the Lord your God. So that's the when. When were these offers, uh, grain offerings offered? It followed the burnt offering. It was also given as a tribute to the king. It was also done as part of their harvest celebrations. They gave their first fruits to the Lord as a grain offering. Now, you just read all this and you say, Pastor, how does it apply to us? Right? How does it apply to us? Well, point number one. Let us take care of our pastors and our missionaries. Let us take care of our pastors and our missionaries. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 3. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is the most holy part of the Lord. It was provided for the priests. Why? Because it was the main income for the priests. Jacob, as you read the book of Genesis, had 12 sons. Of the 12 sons of Jacob, Levi was one of the tribe. And how did the Levites become priests and become Levites caring for the temple? The story goes, and you have to read the book of Exodus for that, that Moses had gone up the mountain in Exodus chapter 32 to meet with the Lord. And when he came down, he saw that the entire group, nation of Israel, from the mountain he saw, they were worshiping the golden calf. And you find that story in Exodus chapter 32. So Moses called out, Is there anyone among you who has not worshipped the golden calf? Only the Levi, the tribe of Levi, was left. He said, Yeah, we haven't worshipped the golden calf. He said, Okay, you guys go and destroy everyone else. And so... The Bible reads in Exodus chapter 32, this was a gruesome task. The Levites were to do, they were to go and they killed uh, the Israelites because of the idolatry. 3,000 Israelites were killed by the sword and the others died by a plague. And the story is given in Exodus chapter 32. And as a result of this, the Levites were set apart for the ministry of the Lord. They were, they were not given any inheritance when the land was split in the book of uh, Joshua, uh, Joshua. When the land was divided, the Levites did not get any inheritance. God did not assign any territory to the Levites. They were to serve in the temple. They had to take care of the temple. They were to take care of the tabernacle before the temple was formed. And among the Levites, only the sons of Aaron could be the priests. So all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. Only the sons of Aaron could be the priests. In the Old Testament, the priests did not have outside jobs. They were set apart for the temple. 
They did not do things on the side, like a side business. They focused on the temple. They focused on the tabernacle. That was a full-time job. They were consecrated for that purpose. They were entirely dependent on the people for survival. The people brought the tithes for the Levites, and the grain offering was food provided for the priests. Now, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, he actually takes this principle, and he gives us a principle. So would you please turn with me to 1 Corinthians Chapter 9, verses 13 through 14. It says, Do you know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple? And those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. That's a principle that he has used, pulled right out of Leviticus. These are priests serving at the temple. In the same way, those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Look at verses 4 through 7 of the same chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 4 through 7. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from the working of a living, for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? So when you read here, you see a direct principle that Paul was teaching. That the preacher of God's word is entitled to be paid for his preaching. He should get enough to cover his housing, his, his expenses. If he's married, his wife needs to be taken care of. That's a great principle. Now, I don't think we need that principle here. You know why? Because I am so grateful for this church. I feel so blessed in how the church has taken care of me and my family over the last couple of years. Thank you for doing that. But not all pastors are so blessed as how you take care of your pastor here at Family Heritage. Many elder boards are all about nickel and dime and they don't care how their pastor lives. But that's not the case here. And God bless you all for that. Thank you for doing what the scriptures tell you to do. But having said that, you need to also understand that we as a church support missionaries. When you bring your offering on a Sunday, we take a tenth of it and we support missionaries around the world and mission organizations around the world. So what happens when you come to the church and you do not give your offering is our weekly offering goes down and eventually it affects our budget and eventually we are not able to give a one-tenth of it because we give a one-tenth of it to the missionaries. But God has been good and God has been gracious as to how he sustains us that we are able to provide for our missionaries over and beyond and bless them. We were able to do amazing things for our missionaries this last year by giving them a great Christmas gift, a year-end giving. And we, we, are, we try to care for our missionaries. And it's all because of your, your love offering that you bring into this church. And I'm sure that the Lord has used you to even support missionaries outside the church. I'm sure many of you are supporting missionaries on your own. God bless you for that. But that's what we need to be doing. That's the principle we see here. A principle of giving to our pastors, our missionaries, our Christian workers. Why? Because they are laboring for the Lord in the Lord's work. And what you have, you give your best without blemish 
or corruption. We do not give out of compulsion. We don't arm twist people into giving. That's not what giving is. In fact, 2 Corinthians, the same chapter, verse 7, we read, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. So it's given cheerfully. So when we think about this, on a side note, I know that some of us are risky with our investments. We want to invest in the right place because we want to get the right returns. Let us learn to be risky with our giving as well. And let us make our pastors and our missionaries and Christian workers our priority. So when you get a paycheck as a believer, you need to keep in mind that there are men laboring for the gospel around the world. And let's bring our grain offerings to the Lord's house. Second, how does it apply to us? As God's people, we bring our tribute to him. And I told you the word tribute is the word minka. Simply means present. So when you come into the Lord's house, you bring your minka to the Lord. That's what the nation of Israel did. Why? Because God was their king. And any time when you went to see your king, you took a minka to the king. We see that in 2 Samuel where the Moabites and the Arameans were subject to King David and they gave a tribute to him. What are the ways we bring our tributes to the Lord? We can bring our tributes to the Lord in different ways. And let me approach it first through the perspective of worship. We gather every day, every Lord's Day in this church to worship God. Why? Because God granted us forgiveness for our sins. And, and we, have, through the burnt offering, we responded by giving to God some of the produce of our land. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, and we are so thankful for the salvation we've enjoyed. And we bring our grain offering. We are dedicating ourselves. We are consecrating ourselves to God, our Savior, our, our Redeemer. He is the King. And as you come into his presence, you give a minka to him. As we give our minka, we are declaring our allegiance to him. So when you come into this temple, and sometimes I want to kind of bring some clarity to this, you know, sometimes we think about the Lord's Day as something, oh, yeah, I just need to go to church. No, it's much more than that. On a Sunday, when you come to the Lord's house, you are coming to the Lord's house with your minka, and you are letting people know, listen, I am devoted to the King of Kings, and I'm here to worship Him. We are saying, God is our King. Isn't that what Psalm 96 says? Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to His name. Bring an offering and come into His courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. So as we come together, we are corporately expressing our, our gratitude. We are expressing our, our worship to Him. We are dedicating ourselves to Him. We are consecrating ourselves to Him. This is why the writer of Hebrews wrote in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, Do not neglect the meeting together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day draw near. That means you've got to meet often. That's a command. You've got to come to church often. It's a command. And as you come, what do you do? Last week, we sang songs. We had the prayer of confession. We confessed our sins to God. We confessed our sins to one another. We participated in the Lord's Supper. And as you're participating in the Lord's Supper, you are telling God, God, I still belong to you. Thank you that you're my Lord and my Savior. And you're telling others around you, you know, listen, I still serve God. I'm His. I worship Him. That's why I'm participating in the communion. I belong to Him. 
you hear the word being proclaimed. And as you hear the word being proclaimed, you're praising God, you're thanking God. This is why worship is so important. You know, in modern day churches, worship is made into a spectator event where the congregation becomes the audience and God becomes the performer. It's like the congregation walks in, come on, come on, God, now you entertain us. No, my beloved, God is the audience. We are the worshipers. We are the participants. We are not passive onlookers. We are active participants. We don't come to church to be entertained. We don't come to church to make us feel good. We don't come to church to boost our ego. We come to worship God. We come here to offer a minka to God, a tribute to God. The worship team just leads us in our worship. They are not the performers. And we are not the spectators. We are all here together as active participants worshiping God. We don't have to be manipulated. We don't have to be massaged. We don't have to get you pumped up in order for you to worship God. Why? We are here to offer our minka to the Lord. Well, some people say you need to sing the right songs. You got to have this. You got to have that. No, my beloved. You should be already prepared to worship God. When you walk in through those doors, through those double doors, you're already prepared to come give your minka to the Lord. It's like this. You go to the gymnasium. You don't go to the gym and just stand there and just look at others working out. That would be weird. I mean, they may inspire you, but you wouldn't just stare at them. You get on the elliptical, you get on the bench press, you pick up the weights, and you work out. In the same way, when you come to church, you don't just stand as a spectator and, and look at other people sing. You don't just stand and look at other people pray. You don't just look at other people open their Bibles. You offer your minka, your grain offering to the Lord. And every time you worship the Lord, our worship should be a pleasing aroma to his nostrils. You know, beloved, we've got to be so careful here. And I've got to be so careful here. You know why? We're living in a consumeristic society. When you think about church and ministry, it's all about budget numbers, people coming into the doors, how many people have you been able to grow. And we've got to be so careful about it. And so the temptation on the pastor is only if I say this joke or if only if I raise my volume or if only if I say something here that will be culturally acceptable, something like borderline profanity, people will be drawn into my sermon. Only if I sing this kind of a song, only if I preach for 20 minutes, only if I do this, a lot of people will come into the church. Only if I'm positive in my sermon, if I don't use those Bible verses, if I don't step on people's toes because I don't want to be accused of turning people away and so you see the temptation on the pastor he turns the congregation into an audience who should be the audience God why because church is meant for believers unbelievers are welcome but we don't structure our church to attract unbelievers. You know, you don't want unbelievers offering minka. In the book of Leviticus chapter 2, unbelievers did not offer minka. It was the believers that offered minka. So if all you do is structure your worship service to attract unbelievers, then no longer is God your audience who has become your audience. Speak to me. 
the congregation. What are some of the other ways we offer tribute to God? You give back to the Lord from your grain offering. It's a tangible way to say, Lord, thank you for what you've given me. These are your possessions and I give them back to you. What are other ways we offer our tribute to God? Will you crawl up to the altar? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Reads this, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That means when you come into this temple, you're saying, Lord, here I am. Take me. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. I'm yours. You're mine. In light of God's mercies, what's your logical response? Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And when you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, is your bodies a living sacrifice, a smooth-smelling aroma to the Lord? Or does he wrinkle up his nose? You know Psalm 60? Sorry, Psalm 40? Psalm 40 reads this. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted. Burned offering and sin offering you have not required. And then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Are you delighting to do his will? And you know, beloved, you will fail. You will fail. But your acceptance before a holy God is not based on how well you perform. Because there is one person who has already performed on your behalf. And I'm not saying it. The Bible says that. Would you please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 5 through 9. Consequently, when Christ came into this world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burned offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. And then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. You have Christ who came into this world and performed the will of his Father to the T. He perfectly performed the will of God. He died on the cross for our sins, and his life is a true grain offering, my beloved. And if you are in Christ, his perfection is yours. And by being in Christ, you're consecrated to him. As you bring your tributes to him, your imperfections, God looks at it through the eyes of Christ. And in Christ, you are perfect, my beloved. Let's look at the third reason, the third application. So yes, we need to take care of our pastors, our missionaries. Yes, we need to bring a a tribute to the Lord. Third, we are filled with gratitude. We are filled with gratitude. You see, the grain offering was offered with the burned offering, right? Right? Think about this. Every morning and every evening, when the worshiper put that animal, that animal was brought in, the perfect sacrifice was brought in, and and the worshiper laid his hand upon the animal, and he took his knife, and he killed the animal, and let the blood draw out, and the priest collected the blood, and sprinkled it on the sides of the altar, and put this animal upon the altar, and it burned, and as the worshiper walked away, all that the worshiper remembered or could even think of was, wow, I should have been on that altar. But in my place lies that innocent animal. Christ was that sacrifice upon the cross. 
And so as the, as the man walked away, he didn't just walk away. He said, thank you. I should have been on that altar, but thank you. Here is my minka. Here is my grain offering. Thank you. I consecrate myself to you. That was the reason. And so when you bring your minka to the Lord, you are saying, thank you, Lord. I am so thankful for salvation that you've given me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, He who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might have the righteousness of God. So thank you, Lord. And you know, Lord, thank you for salvation. Here's everything I have. Here's my possession. You use it the way you want it. Here's my money. You use it the way you want it. Here's my health. You use it the way you want it. Here's myself as a living sacrifice. You use it, Lord, the way you want me to. Because all that I could do is thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Take my life. All that is given to me by my king, take it. Another reason that they gave the grain offering is seen in verses 14 through 16. It's an offering of first fruits. You know, it's the harvest time. The harvest came because God gave me the strength to bring that harvest. You remember, they were farmers in Leviticus. Farmers did not sit on a lazy boy and sip lemonade all day. You know how farmers work, right? They get up in the morning even before it's sun, uh, sun rises. They go up into the fields while it's dark. They work on the fields all day. And they return after sunset. Then they have to plow. They have to harvest. And then collect the grain. And even as the grain comes up, the fresh green years. Lord, thank you. I'm getting this because of you. It's not my strength. It is not my abilities. It's not my skill. It's all yours. And so here, take them back. I give it to you. That's what first fruit meant. That means you're thankful. Beloved, you have a work, you have a job. Who gave it to you? God. Do you have the strength to wake up in the morning and go do that work? Who gave you the strength? God. You go to work and you're able to do your work to the best of your ability, your wisdom, your skill. Who gave you that? God. And now when you get your paycheck... You want all of it? Or are you filled with gratitude? And say, Lord, thank you. Here's my first fruit. They belong to you. Take it back. Beloved, we are, are we willing to dedicate a portion of our harvest to the Lord? When was the last time you depleted all your resources because you gave to the Lord? And if you're afraid to give to the Lord... Listen, my beloved, if you're afraid to give to the Lord, it is because you don't trust Him to provide for you. Are you grateful for what God has given you? Lastly, I do need to look at the three things that were told in the book of Leviticus chapter 2. No honey, no yeast, right? Well, you know yeast and honey, yeast is an organic compound, right? You put it into something, it deteriorates, it, it decays. And so obviously, the sacrifice had to be perfect, without blemish, no corruption. So possible that the yeast or the leaven would corrupt the offering. Honey was again organic. It would corrupt the offering. And so I believe leaven and honey were not to be used because God wanted an offering that was pristine and without decay. But what about the salt? This had to be included in the offering. It was called the salt of the covenant. Three times we read in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt three times. Why should we not forget salt? Well, salt is a preservative. Salt preserves. Salt prevents decay. Salt is associated with covenant. 
You put salt on the grain offerings and it burns and everything else gets consumed, but what's left behind is salt. You see, salt is a valuable commodity in many cultures. It is said that the word salary comes from the word salt money in the Romans. Even today, we refer to someone who pays, who earns his pay as still said to be worth the salt. Salt has been used to express promises and friendship between people. In some Arab cultures, if two men partake of salt together, they are sworn to protect one another, even if they had previously been enemies. So if there are enemies in this church, get some salt together, you be friends. In the ancient world, if two parties were making an agreement, a contract, they would eat salt in the presence of witnesses. That would bind their contract. The Old Testament law commands the use of salt in all grain offerings. Why? Would you please turn with me to Numbers? Numbers chapter 18. Verse 19. All the holy contributions that the people of Israel present to the Lord, I give to you. You see that? Who are the people? The priests and the Levites. So God is saying, Yahweh is saying, all the holy contributions that the people of Israel present to the Lord, I give it to you and to your sons and daughters with you as a perpetual due. It is a covenant of salt before the Lord for you and for your offspring with you. And verse 20 says, The Lord said to Aaron, You shall not have any inheritance in the land, neither shall you have any portion among them. So here God is saying, Listen, I'm making a covenant with you, a covenant of salt, that everything that's brought into the Lord's presence, I'm giving it to you. So when the worshiper put salt on the offerings, it was a reminder that God was in an eternal covenant relationship with them. That God would never forsake them. That God would perpetually keep them, uphold them in His covenant. Hebrews chapter 8 brings the new aspect into a focus in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 10 through 12 says, For this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. After the days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For I'll be merciful towards their sins, and I will remember their sins no more. Here God of the New Testament is making a covenant, a covenant of salt with the people that says, I will be your God, and I will be with you forever and ever. It's a perpetual covenant. A God is a promise-keeping God. He promises to be with us forever and ever. Jesus Christ is faithful. He is true. He is always by our side. And, and so when, when the salt was put on the altar, it was a reminder to the nation of Israel that God was their covenant God and that God would always be with them forever and ever. That as long as there was salt there, they would bring their attention to their mind that I belong to God and He is my God. Beloved, are you weak? Are you heavy laden? Are you burdened with the load of care? Are you distressed? Are you wondering if there is any hope in life? Are you looking at the circumstances in your life and wondering if God will ever come through? Maybe you're praying for something in your life. Maybe you're not being healed. Maybe you just did a surgery and you're hoping that the surgery would have turned out well and everything would go well with you, but nothing's going well. Maybe you're praying for someone's salvation. Maybe in all these things, you don't know how it's all going to turn out. My beloved, 
May I point you to the salt on the altar of your grain offerings and encourage you that God is always on your side. That God has not forgotten you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He has made a covenant with you, and he will never break his covenant. And the salt is a reminder of that. And as you look at the salt on the altar, may this be a reminder that God is faithful. Tell this to your children. Tell this to your children's children. Look, do you see that salt? That's a covenant. That's a God. That's an unchanging God. And he will never break his promises. He is with us forever. John chapter 10, 28 says, I give them eternal life so that they won't, no one will perish. And no one can snatch you out of my hands. You're secure in the hands of a holy God. And may we remind ourselves of our covenant with God. That we will love him as we bring our men car to the Lord. Lord, here's the soul. And this is a reminder to me that as I come into your presence, Lord, that I will love you all the days of my life. And that I will love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. And I give you completely over to you, Lord. I'm yours. You're mine. Praise God. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the Old Testament. We thank you that you give us opportunities such as this, Lord, to, to dive into the, to the book of Leviticus and to, to discover, Lord, the riches of truth that's there for us. And I pray, Lord, that we would continue to give our best to you. Lord, we just crawl to the altar as a living sacrifice. Use it. Is holy and acceptable. And we know we are holy and we are acceptable. Not because of anything we do. Lord, we are sinners. Even right now, as we grow towards perfection, we still sin. But we know we are considered righteous because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. He is perfect. And His perfection is ours because of what you've done. So thank you. Our hearts are filled with thankfulness for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's children say, Amen.